In this series of videos, we've been talking about God's existence, His reality, what He's made of, which are the types of questions wrestled with in a branch of philosophy called ontology. So we've learned that God is spirit, and that matter and spirit, though two very distinct realities, are somewhat similar as well. We learned that pantheism, which is the idea that the universe is God, isn't the biblical God. We talked about the glory of God, and how every time God showed up in the Bible, He always emitted bright light, fire, and electricity. But does this mean that God is light? Is God fire? Is He electricity? If you've been tracking with me in my other videos, then you know what I'm going to say here. No, God is not in the forces of nature. And the fabric of the cosmos is not made out of quantized pieces of God's being. So how are we to understand the light of God and the manifestations of glory? That's what we're going to explore in this video. So let's first start in John's first epistle where he wrote, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, did John mean that God is literally light, like God is made of light? I personally believe that John is using the term both literally and metaphorically. The biblical writers often used light to describe God, because if you think about it, every time the purest, holiest being in the universe manifested His presence, what did they see? Bright light. So they made the connection between light and purity, light and God light and holiness. What does light do? It reveals. And that's what God does. He reveals truth. Light also shows us the way things really are. That is what God does. He opens our eyes to reality, to truth. See, darkness came to represent evil, things that are hidden, things that we don't know. And God's light, God's truth, shows us the way things really are. So this is how God and light came to be connected. And just as we don't consider Satan to be made of darkness, because, you know, darkness isn't anything, it's the absence of light. It has no material reality. God, likewise, is not literally made of light, even though He is described in those terms. So light and dark in the Bible can be used literally and metaphorically. And the context, of course, determines how you use it. In the context of 1 John, John is talking about good behavior, so he's talking about light and purity. But there are passages that show God literally emitting light. And here's one from Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. All right, now let's go to Revelation 22, verse 5, the very next chapter. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now this is an example of where the Bible is not speaking metaphorically. Here it seems to say that God will literally illuminate the new heaven and new earth by His glorious presence. So let's see if we can make some sense of this scientifically. What's going on here with this light? Well, we first need to understand what light is. Have you ever actually thought about it? What is light composed of? Is it a substance? How can we even answer this question and understand something that travels at 186,000 miles per second? You know, physicists have been able to make light slow down, but they can't hold it and look at it and see what it's made of. As a matter of fact, photons of light are invisible while they are in motion and can only be seen when they hit an object. So the light travels as a wave, but when it reaches its destination, it pops into a particle. The field of quantum mechanics revealed that the electromagnetic force, light, which propagates through space as an electromagnetic wave, is quantized, hence the word quantum. It's quantized in little packets of energy called photons. So when you consider the light coming from the 100-watt light bulb in your ceiling, or the lamp, you can imagine the bulb emitting a field of 100 billion billion invisible photons each second. The energy in the light doesn't even manifest until it interacts with something. While it travels, it exists everywhere in the quantum field at once, 
and then pops into a photon when it hits another atom. The same can be said for all elementary particles, and hence the reason the double-slit experiment showed a wave pattern, instead of just two lines, on the detector screen. This demonstrates that matter and energy are manifestations of an omnipresent divine energy field that I call the spirit field. You can check out my video called Quantum God if you want to know more about that. So let's talk about how light manifests. Light is manufactured at the subatomic level when electrons move around in their different orbits. Electrons exist at certain energy levels, or orbitals, which are specific distances from the nucleus of the atom. Their ground state is home base for the electrons. It's the orbit they prefer to be in. But they can become excited and jump to higher energy levels if they absorb light energy. When photons of light that are traveling at a certain frequency hit an electron, the electron absorbs that photon and moves to an orbit farther away from the nucleus. The electrons do not like to carry this extra energy and like to cool down, so they immediately release this energy in a photon of light and fall back to their ground state orbits. Now listen to this. When the electron falls to its ground state, it doesn't actually move through space. It dematerializes and then rematerializes at another location, as if the electron teleports. When an existing photon hits an electron, the photon is destroyed and its energy is transferred to the electron. Amazingly, the electron emits an entirely new photon when it falls back to its ground state. It doesn't release the same photon it absorbed. It's a new one. Where did that photon come from? Do electrons carry a vast internal reservoir of photons that can be retrieved as needed? Amazingly, the photon just pops into existence out of the quantum field of information. Now, I just mentioned the 100 white light bulb emitting 100 billion billion photons each second. Now you can better understand how that works. When you flip the light switch on the wall, it sends an electrical current to the light bulb. As the electrons flow through the filament, they bombard the atoms that make up the filament, and they become excited. When these atoms absorb this energy, their electrons move to higher energy levels and then fall back to their ground state 100 billion billion times per second. Each time these electrons fall back to their ground state, they emit a photon. So now that we know all of that, we can now better understand how God manifested His glory in the Bible. We saw a consistent pattern with all of these theophanies. We saw fire, bright light, lightning emanating from God. So let's talk about what fire actually is. Well, let's use a campfire as an example. The wood you place in the fire pit is made of mostly carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. When heat is applied to these atoms, their chemical bonds break, and some of the atoms escape into the air right above the wood as a vapor. When these chemicals mix with the oxygen in the air, they emit light and heat. The wood is actually not even on fire. It's the gases that rise just above the wood that emit light, because they are in an excited state due to the heat. It's very similar with a candle. The wax that is used to make candles is paraffin which is made up of many carbon atoms. When the wax is heated, the chemical bonds in the carbon atoms are broken due to their excited state, and some of these atoms escape. As these escaped atoms mix with the oxygen atoms and the air right above the wick, they are ignited, creating a flame. So here's a question. Can the atmosphere, or the air we breathe, catch on fire? I ask this because the biblical writers all described fire when they wrote about their encounters with God's glory. This was also something that came up during the Second World War when scientists began to ask questions about dropping atom bombs. They were concerned that the intense heat energy caused by the fission bombs would cause the atoms in the atmosphere to begin a chain reaction of nuclear fusion that would burn up the Earth's atmosphere. As it turns out, this is impossible because of the nitrogen and other gases like CO2 in the atmosphere. See, they're non-flammable, even at higher temperatures. But how is it that we see the air on fire when God enters a region of space? God is spirit, and we can't see spirit. 
but we can see the region of space around God because the energy from His glory excites the atoms around Him, causing them to emit light and catch on fire. The energy God emits is way more powerful than a nuclear bomb, you understand. His presence is so intense, it can actually set the air molecules on fire, and they're usually not flammable. And this is what the biblical writers saw when they had encounters with God's glory. Now think about this amazing passage from 2 Peter. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? Wow, think about that. It takes incredibly high temperatures, like what is found in the core of stars, for elements like nitrogen to burn. So just imagine how much power and energy God emits in His glory. No wonder we need new bodies to exist in heaven. His glory would destroy us. God's presence also manifested as lightning. So what is lightning? Well, it's a very bright, hot, it's actually hotter than the surface of the sun, flow of electrons creating electricity. Think about a thunderstorm. The lightning happens because the upper regions of the clouds become positively charged from an accumulation of protons, and the lower cloud regions become negatively charged because all of the electrons accumulate there. Sometimes the electrons can accumulate so much in the lower regions of the clouds that the negative charge they create can extend all the way to the ground and it can push the electrons in the ground further into the earth. Remember, like charges repel. What this does is it leaves the positively charged protons exposed at the ground surface, ready to attract the negatively charged electrons in the clouds. And we all know what happens. When opposites get close, they attract. A path is created from the clouds to the ground, allowing free-flowing electrons to move, creating a current. When the electrons flow through this path, they excite the atoms in the air around this path, causing them to emit light. This is precisely what happens when God enters our matrix. His glorious presence interacts with the countless electrons in the region of space around Him, and it creates lightning and fire. But we must never say that God is the fire or that He is the electricity. No, His presence is what creates the fire and electricity, and the light. Now, all of this explains why God and humans cannot coexist. As long as we humans are in our current flesh bodies, in our sinful dead state, the glory of God would destroy us. Our physical bodies are full of sin and much too weak to exist in the glorious atmosphere of heaven, and we would be completely pulverized. We are so fragile that we can't even stand next to a campfire. Imagine God's glory. We get a sunburn and we get cancer from light that has been traveling eight minutes from a star that is 93 million miles away. How good are you going to do standing right next to the glory of God, which is far more intense than a star? Just imagine what kind of suntan you'd get standing in the light of God unfiltered. You could wear the most powerful sunscreen or some powerful spacesuit but it would still destroy you if you got too close. This is why we need new, upgraded bodies to live in the glory of heaven. And praise God, we are going to get these new upgraded bodies at the resurrection.